Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them, and we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week is... The Many Deaths of Layla Starr, number three, from Boom Studios. Now, this is written by Rom V. It's got artwork by Felipe Andrade. I absolutely love this book. It continuously blows me away issue to issue. It is a story about the God of Death, the representation of death being fired from heaven, from the Pantheon, because a child has been born that will bring immortality to the human race. Okay, so death gets canned in a very bureaucratic, corporate type way, and now she has to live out a mortal life. Well, now she's decided that she's going to find this kid who's going to bring immortality and hunt him down and kill him. And each time she tries it, or each time she encounters this child, she winds up dying. The many deaths of Layla Starr. Get it? So... In this issue, she is yet again trying to experience humanity. She's almost kind of forgotten about the kid. And of course, the kid's story, a little bit older now, gets wrapped up and involved in everything. This book is amazing. Like, from Rom V, it's got such a whimsical nature about it, but it loses none of the, the nuanced resonance of the deep, um, the deep thoughts about death and grief and loss and life and love, and, and youth, and that gets encapsulated so perfectly here in very, very little space. What Rom V can accomplish with very little is astounding to me, and the artwork, the artwork is absolutely amazing. Inez Amaro does some of the colors assisting here. The color choices are amazing, bright, bold, psychedelic at times, totally fits, and one thing also to make this book even crazier is that it's narrated by a cigarette burning out and how that relates to the story. <sighs> Loved it. Many Deaths of Layla Star, number three. The pick of the week, but let's jump over to Marvel because they got Venom 200s finally here. Finally. The big encapsulation of Donny Cates' run on Venom. Was it a great epilogue? Did it set up some nice things for the next writers, Rom V and Al Ewing, to take up? Yes, absolutely. It was a long time coming. I think that this issue would have had more of a punch had it actually been out a little shortly after King and Black number five. It really does help kind of wrap all of it up, wrap the entire story that 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 Donnie's been telling about Eddie Brock, about about depression and anxiety, if you will, but about loneliness and isolation, um, dependency. Right. <clears throat> this is. The story that Donny Cates has been building up, and this leads to its very emotional climax and resolution with a very exciting setup for what's to come. So the world of Venom has completely changed, and it changes in ways that we thought would be obvious and in ways that we uh, <clears throat> didn't really call. So I was really kind of surprised by some of the choices Donny Cates and company made in here. It's got a whole bunch of artists, uh, Ryan Stegman, Mark Bagley, Ron Lim, a whole bunch, and it was nice. The artwork's a bit inconsistent as it goes through, but that's just going to be the nature of this type of story. It is $10. <clears throat> it's got a crap ton of covers, but I, I really liked it. If you've been following the Donny Cates run, if you've been really, really liking it, Definitely jump on. And of course, I know that you've already heard some of the spec warnings and alerts for that book. Anyway, Planet Size X-Men is here. So we knew that out of the entire Hellfire Gala, this was going to be the book that revealed what happened when everybody saw the fireworks, when the X-Men, when Emma Frost wowed humanity. What did they do? Well, <clears throat> I was wrong. But some other people who have theorized this were completely right, even in my own comments. Anyway, I actually like this issue. I thought it was really good. Jerry Duggan is the writer. Pepe Larraz is the artist. Whenever Pepe Larraz does an X-Men book, it's always going to be exciting, flashy, flamboyant, and important. This is a rather important issue when it comes to the ongoing saga of the Krakoan-Hickman era 
X-Men. So I would not miss out on this one if you are following any of the X-Books in any kind of way. Big, big ramifications, I'm sure, for the upcoming pages of X-Men and whatever else Hickman decides to be doing and setting up. But this was actually a really cool issue. I don't want to spoil what the thing is, but we'll be talking about it on the channel soon. Planet Size X-Men number one. <clears throat> I really liked it. I thought it was solid. Demon Days, Mariko is here. Uh, Mariko is here from Peach Momoko. I really liked this book. I almost didn't want to read it, but I remembered really liking the last one. And the last one really surprising me that Peach Momoko was not just a great artist, but a great uh, sequential storyteller, just a great storyteller in general. That continues on in this one. It's kind of based on Japanese folklore and with the, the spin of putting Marvel characters in it. So it's definitely an Elseworlds-y type thing. And they're all a series of one-shots, like quarterly or something, but they are kind of connected, I guess. But I, I really had a lot of fun with it. It had this nice fable kind of nature about it. The artwork was amazing. The composition, the storytelling, the coloring. I really, really liked it. Thought it was solid. So yeah, this whole Demon Days thing that Peach Momoko's doing, <clears throat> I'm liking it so far. Heroes Reborn is here with issue number seven, the final issue. Not really. There's a one-shot, Heroes Return. That's really the final issue. But what this does is now that we have set up the idea that something has happened, the Avengers are gone, and so now there's a new reality in which the Squadron Supreme rule the world, basically, in a very much a Justice League of America crime syndicate almost kind of way. Um, and then there's all these teases with Mephisto and whatnot. So then we had a series of basically one-shots throughout the rest of the series, spotlighting, highlighting, each individual member of the squadron. And this one, it brings it all together. There were threads in each of the story. They start coming together. This is about the squadron getting together, recognizing that there is a problem, that there was another world, maybe. Maybe there are something called the Avengers. What's going on with that? But I actually like this issue. As an event, I don't think it works, but as just a solid Squadron Supreme story tied in with what Jason Aaron's doing in the pages of Avengers, I'm, I'm liking it. We got Aaron Cooter here on the artwork. And I think that was pretty solid as well. And of course, like I said, all set up for the big slam bang finale. But some really interesting things are revealed towards the end of this book um, that I liked. So here's board number seven. I mean, I'm liking that series so far. I mean, to be honest with you, Weapon X and the Final Flight. Uh, so this is the last of the one shots tied in, aside from the finale one shot, Heroes Re Return, tied into Heroes Reborn. Uh, this one was okay. There's a moment in The Heroes Reborn where they mention uh, Wolverine, like killing Hyperion or something like that. Obviously, that's not the case. This tells that story. Uh, what is Wolverine up to? You know, uh, what does he do after, you know, is, there's some revelations about what happens in this world. And this kind of just gives you a little bit more information on that. It's written by Ed Brisson. So it's actually not bad, but it's not essential. And it wasn't super necessary. But if you are very curious as to what happened with Wolverine in this world... Here you go. This is the book for you. So there you go. Fantastic Four is here with issue number 33. Still loving Fantastic Four right now. I think Dan Slott's really come into his own on this book. He's, he's owning it. <clears throat> I think the biggest thing is that he doesn't have these other books kind of getting in the way. It doesn't feel like Dan Slott can carry two books in a month, which is odd for a writer. However, as long as Fantastic Four has this quality, this, this reverence for the past, um, in the present and the future, I'm loving it. So this, of course, is the second part of the Bride of Doom story. Victorious is marrying Victor Von Doom. It's just like a <clears throat> political type wedding type thing. Uh, and in the last issue, we found out that, that Johnny Storm had slept with Victorious. And so, of course, that's going to lead in some hijinks here. The Fantastic Four and other heroes are invited to the Wedding of Doom with the promise that if they attend, everything will be forgiven. No more enemies, right? So Reed Richards and the Four and others cannot pass up that opportunity. But, of course, with this background between Johnny and Victorious, <laughs> yo, come on. You know it ain't going to go smoothly. This moment, this move, <clears throat> this movie, no. This comic book had moments that made me just straight up laugh and enjoy. I love it. I'm an old school Fantastic Four fan since like the mid 80s. So super excited about this one. I love that the four are finally back and it seems like 30 something issues in. We're finally getting it. R.B. Silva's artwork felt a bit rushed. 
I'll be honest, I'll just say that. Miles Morales' Spider-Man issue number 27, continuing his own version of the Clone Saga, but a little bit different, not as overwrought, uh, for sure, as the uh, the Peter Parker Clone Saga from the 90s, but more akin to the original Clone Saga. Um, I really like this story. I think it's cool. So this villain had captured Miles issues and issues ago, and now it's all come to fruition where he's actually was experimenting on Miles and he's cloned him. So Miles up against his clones, but he's kind of got this moral conundrum because he thinks he's doing the right thing by doing whatever it takes to defeat the clones and stop them from their goals. But what if their goals are just self-preservation? Yeah, it's a little Blade Runner, but it's Miles. And the artwork by Carmen Canero is pretty solid too. So Spider-Man, Miles Morales, 27. I liked it. Alien is here with issue number four. This book's starting to wear thin on me just a little bit. I still like elements of it. I like the overall story. Um, I like the dialogue. I like the pace and flow of the script. It's the artwork for me starting to feel a bit stagnant. That's something I find in Salvador LaRocca's work. That's just me personally. Sometimes I think it feels a bit stiff and it doesn't really have a nice sense of motion, movement, and flow. Right? I really feel like the Alien book would benefit from that, especially since there's a lot of action going on into this book. So I think it's a mix match right now with the artist and the story. But aside from that, I am liking the story and we do get the full on introduction of the Alpha Alien and what it looks like and it's pretty BA and I liked it a lot. So this book's a little uneven for me because I just don't think the art and the story are working very well together. I think they have two completely different ideas going on. But Alien number four is out this week. Let's jump over to DC. Static season one, number one, Vita Ayala, Criss Cross, Nicholas Draper, Ivy. Um, I like this book. I'll tell you this. This is a complete relaunch and reboot of the Milestone universe. Um, so this is not like much of the static that you've seen before. It's a bit different. Of course, a lot is still there. A lot of the character threads carry through the heart of the character, I believe. And, but I have a limited background with, with the Milestone stuff. I've actually never really delved too deeply into it. And it's something I've always wanted to do. But DC's never really kept that shit in print. Um, but Static Season 1, number 1, starts off pretty solid. It was a really great first issue. I thought it was one of the best mainstream Big 2 Vita Ayala scripts I have read from them. So that was really exciting. The artwork was amazing. I'm a fan of Criss Cross from back in the 90s. But like... This felt different and fresh, and it felt really vibrant, and I, something I really, really like. Now, this does directly pick up from the Milestone Returns one-shot, the number zero. So if you didn't get that, you're going to be a little lost. There are moments in there that you're going to want because it kicks off the origin of Static in this new world that's vaguely familiar, yet a little bit different. But Static Season 1, number one, I thought was an electrifying first issue. See what I did there? Supergirl World of Tomorrow, number one, from DC Comics, written by Tom King, with artwork by Bill Quiz Evely. Or is it Bill Key Evely? Anyway, and Matthew Lopez. Okay, that's the exact same art team from Simon Spurrier's The Dreaming. Doing a science fiction, fantasy-based Supergirl story that is, in fact, set in continuity. I really, really like this book. This may not be the typical artwork that you're expecting out of a Supergirl book, but it works for me. It's violent, it's brutal, um, and it's real. What happens here is that on her 21st birthday, Supergirl goes to a world around a red sun and wants to go drink and get drunk for the first time, right? And, you know, she's dealing with a lot. She really is, you know, way more so than Clark. Clark has a memory, I guess, of Krypton, but, like, Carl was there. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, she had friends and family that she knew and loved that she lost. So it's nice to see that be dealt with a little bit. So she's on her 21st birthday trying to go get drunk around a red sun. And on this planet, this woman is wronged. Her father's like murdered or something. She's trying to find like a warrior, a bodyguard to like, to pay, to go on this quest to, for a vengeance. <clears throat> and she comes across Supergirl. And Supergirl doesn't want to get involved, but of course she's going to get involved. I like this book a lot. I thought it was super, super solid. And one of the best Supergirl books I have read in a long time. It really got me excited, really got me interested. I thought it was a re really great perspective and dynamic on the character. I love the way the artwork works with the story. It's got a lot of complexity and texture to it. I thought it was fantastic. Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, number one from DC. Then we got Nightwing, number 81, loving this book, loving that cover. That's the villain, Heartless. Cause I'm heartless, and I'm back to my ways, cause I'm heartless. I knew that was happening one day. 
I knew that would happen when they introduced a villain called Heartless. It's like, one day I'm just going to go into the weekend. Anyway, this book has been amazing. It continues to be amazing. It kind of wraps up the initial story arc, and it has a big slam-bang revelation at the end that really is going to make a lot of people want to come back for issue number 82 and maybe even start specking on some stuff. But Nightwing number 81 does exactly what the previous few issues have done. Um, stylish artwork, really excellent composition, amazing work with the character, with the dialogue, with the script, and every single bit of pacing. This book is top-notch, and it's already feeling like an instant classic on the run. Nightwing 81, Tom Taylor, Bruno Redondo. Whew, it's awesome. And I'm back to my ways. Catwoman, number 32 from Rom V. You know I'm loving Rom V and what he's doing, especially on superhero comic books right now. Catwoman, he's making Catwoman a must-read for me. I haven't felt like this since Catwoman about Catwoman since like the Ed Brubaker run. So that's really nifty. Um, we got a guest artist on this book, but it does not disappoint. It's even Cagle. Excellent work. Excellent layouts. Very rich detail. Very nice line work that it feels a little edgy, but not like scritch scratchy or anything, but it's got grit to it. So this is kind of like a, it's not really a filler issue because what's happening is it's taking a step back and it's, there's an interrogation by this new villain, which is so freaking creepy. This dude is amazing. He's interrogating and talking to different people, trying to figure out more about Selena Kyle. So we get more information th that we get more information about Selena Kyle's past and her character. Ron B completely understands this and also knows how to tie it all up into a crime fiction heist type story. That's what I love about this book is it's not just some kind of like artsy fartsy type thing. It's also very exciting. It's got dynamic heist action. It's it's a Catwoman book, but it has a lot of weight to it. It's got a thread of drama, of emotion, of, of humanity going throughout it. And I love it. Catwoman number 32, fan freaking tastic. The Flash, 771. Y'all, I'm loving The Flash. I am. There was one issue I thought was a misstep. That was like the second issue of this run post- um, Infinite Frontier Zero or whatever, but like, yo, I'm loving it. So right now what's going on is Wally West is trying to quit being the Flash, even though at the end of Death Metal, he said, yeah, I guess I'll be the Flash. Right, whatever, right? So something happens before he gets to quit, and he's been bouncing around through the Omniverse into different speedsters' bodies. In this one, he's in the reverse Flash's body from the world of Challenge of the Super Friends trying to join the Legion of Doom, and it is hilarious. It is freaking fantastic. And I loved every single bit of that story. Plus, you get a Lexor. It's not the Lexor 7, probably the Lexor 3. But you also get lots of other references to other Flash characters and Flash worlds. Um, a little bit of a glimpse of Wally's future. And then, of course, it wraps it all back up here at Sanctuary. And now we're going to have one more issue of this story, which I'm sure is going to be them. Another person trying to, like, sorry we did the Sanctuary thing. Let's try to, let's try to just squash it. Let's try to squash. It was a scroll. Anyway, Flash 771, though. Flash has actually been really good. Legends of the Dark Knight is here with issue number two. Why do you, should you care about this book? Derek Robertson is writing and illustrating it. That's right. Derek Robertson, illustrator. Robertson, illustrator of The Boys and Transmetropolitan. Come on. Fresh off of Space Bastards. It's doing a Legends of the Dark Knight story. You know, if the tie-in run's not quite for you, if you don't like the Tamaki stuff, if you want more familiar Batman stories with familiar Batman villains... You should check this one out. Plus, it has the introduction of a brand new villain, so it does have a first appearance in it. Um, I think the book's pretty cool. I don't think it's as exciting as some of the stuff being done in Detective or in Batman right now, but it is fun to kind of have a nice fun. It is fun to have a nice kind of fun. That's really that's really great, Robbie. That's so freaking articulate. Anyway, Legends of the Dark Knight number two starts off with a little bit of Joker, then goes into a little bit of a new villain, kind of associated with the Riddler in a way. Um, but I like it. So if you want something a little bit more old school, a little bit something more familiar, Legends of the Dark Knight is definitely going to be for you. Superman Red and Blue issue number four is here. It's an anthology series. Overall, this one hasn't been as good as the Batman Black and White, and that kind of saddens me because I think there's a lot more that you could do with Superman that hasn't been done with Batman a thousand times. Um, Superman doesn't usually get the opportunity to shine with a bunch of different visions and creators working on an anthology. Plus, you got the red and blue aspect, so I think artistically you could do some really cool things with that. And the artwork throughout this book is, for the most part, pretty solid. The stories are okay. Mark Wade, Audrey Mock, that's a fine enough mixed Pitalik story. Francis Manipool does a story in here that has amazing artwork, but I could not for the life of me 
understand what the hell was going on. Robert Vendetti, Aletha Martinez, they do a pretty just kind of generic average Superman type story. Michael W. Conrad, Cully Hamner, great artwork by my hometown hero, Cully Hamner, but like for real, like I just couldn't get into that one. And then Rich Duick and Joe Quinones, that was the highlight of this issue. Rich Duick is the writer of Sea of Sorrows, Road of Bones, uh, The Wailing Blade, Gutter Magic. I mean, I really, really respect his work. Getting to see him do something with Superman, I was very excited and curious to see what he would do, and I was not disappointed. And he also got paired up with Joe Quinones. Come on. Come on. Truth and Justice is here with issue number five. This book's been a series of one-shots by different creators. Um, this one spotlights Batwoman. It's kind of like Batwoman versus Mothman, and that's a cool enough thing. But the issue itself didn't really do anything exceptional, didn't do anything significant. It was just kind of an okay type story. And the problem is with anthologies, it just can't be okay. It's got to be something different. Now, let me tell you about this one. Represent is a one-shot comic book. It's an anthology of different writers, uh, different voices telling different stories. Um, none of it superhero. Some of it, at least one of them, kind of superhero related in a way. But none of them are about superheroes. They're about real life type stuff. So they're real true stories or they're based on real stories from the, the writers and the creators of these projects. And they usually deal with the, with the experience of the black American uh, throughout the decades. And I found this to be rather fantastically done. I was not looking forward to it. I thought it would probably come across, I thought it would come across a bit preachy, maybe a bit too on the nose, but it didn't. I really like this. Each story for the most part had some nugget of something that I could really hold on to. So I really liked it. Not a lot of creators that I am familiar with. It tells their story. So that was, I mean, I really liked it. It's $10. And when you got a $10 Venom book and $10 represent, I understand you're going to probably go with the Venom, but Represent was actually pretty solid. I, I, I like that. Let's jump over to Image. And from Image, we have Compass number one, or should I say Compass, the Cauldron of Eternal Life number one. Now, this is a new book. It says Greg Rucka Presents. Basically, Greg Rucka met some friends, um, and he thought they had really good ideas, and he gave them a shot. Uh, David Walker, Robert McKenzie, and Justin Greenwood on the art. I, I, I actually kind of like this book. Um, it's got a rough, raw grit type style, very textured to the artwork that I thought was interesting, especially for this type of story. Usually you would get something a little bit more flowy, a bit more clean. Um, this is kind of like an, uh, like, a, like a Middle Eastern Indiana Jones or something like this. So this woman, she's, uh, I, I don't know, but she's from the Middle East and, and she's like an Indiana Jones type character. So there's treasure hunting, there's adventure, there's double crossing, there's all kinds of interesting stuff. A lot of the pages have no dialogue, so it is a breeze to read at first. Then it gets a bit heavier, so it does feel a little bit imbalanced because of that. But overall, I thought it was decent. It didn't really do anything new, supremely new, to make me like, oh wow, that's the best treasure hunting story I've ever read. But it was decent enough to maybe make me come in and check out issue number two, but it all depends on what else comes out that week. But Compass, the Gauldron of Eternal Life, number one from Image Comics. We also got Time Before Time, number two. This was a fantastic second issue because I really liked the concept in the first issue, but some things were a bit unclear. I didn't quite know where it was going to go. Um, and now in the second issue, it just completely blew my mind because it explains more of the story, does a bit more world building and character work, but it doesn't do it through an info dump, an exposition. It does it naturally through the actions of the characters, through the dialogue and conversations with the characters. I really like it. You get more of a sense that time is ruled by gangs and they each have turf, meaning like a block of centuries and you don't want to wind up in the wrong gang or in one gang, but on the other gang's turf as far as when you travel back through time. This story is basically about these illegal operations that are taking goods from the future back into the past and selling them or transplanting people all for money. Really interesting type stuff, and the way it gets further developed in issue number two I thought was great. The artwork is pretty solid. It's not going to be to everybody's liking. It's a bit more simple than what I think some people are going to be used to, but I think it really, really worked. The coloring, the dynamic, it is all there. Time Before Time number two was an excellently done second issue. Stillwater is here with issue number eight, and I am loving this book. Issue number eight was fantastic, kind of introducing... Is this, I don't remember if this is a new character that we haven't seen before, if we briefly saw her, but it goes deep into this certain character, her journey, how she winds up involved in Stillwater, how she winds up in the position that she's in, and then immediately 
brings you right back to where the current story is. I thought that was fantastic. I'm loving what Chip Zdarsky is doing with the character work. He's already got a cool concept. It's about the southern town in which everybody inside doesn't age, doesn't die. But So they want to keep it a super secret. But what happens when someone goes, hey... We're just noticing some of the records are off in this town. Let's go check it out. I really like this book. Ramon K. Perez doing a great job with the covers, with the interior artwork. Mike Spicer on the coloring. Y'all, Stillwater's back, and you know I love that book. The Silver Coin is here with issue number three. So I've been loving the Silver Coin. It's about the Silver Coin. It's an anthology series. Every issue is going to be uh, illustrated by Michael Walsh, but it's going to be a different writer on each issue. We had Chip Zdarsky, we had Kelly Thompson. I loved both those issues. Now we got Ed Brisson. I liked this issue, but I found this one way confusing. Like, I can understand. I know that Bullseye Bob from Everything Comics and Bueller from Comics with Bueller. By the way, Station Bueller, 20K, couldn't have happened to a nicer dude. It's all, you got to credit it all to Bob, though, let's be honest. But, you know, they didn't quite understand how the coin would come into play in the second issue. I, I picked up a little bit more on that. But on this one, like, I'm kind of confused. I'm kind of confused because this doesn't work as a one-and-done story for me because I was very lost and confused. But is there something that they're building that they've all come together? And I noticed this for the first time. It says the silver coin is created by Michael Walsh, Ed Brisson, Jeff Lemire, Kelly Thompson, Chip Zdarsky. That makes me feel like this is a setup issue that's supposed to make sense something i don't know the next issue is by jeff lemire and it's set way in the future this was interesting i liked the story i loved the artwork i liked the execution of it it worked except for i just didn't quite get a connection i don't know i think this is one that's going to make sense later i think that's part of it but if not if this is like if this issue doesn't ever reference anything ever that happens in this world again, I don't know about that. So that one's kind of, I'm kind of iffy on that one because I really like the artwork. I thought it was very atmospheric and creepy at times, but I just can't quite connect it for some reason. Maybe that's on me. Maybe that's on me. Radiant Black is here with, what is this? Issue number five. After the slam bang events of, of the last issue, where do we go from here? You know, oh, where do we go from here? See, I didn't sing enough on Rock and Robbie Live this week, so now I'm, I'm like doing it here. I'm going to stop. Anyway, Radiant Black number five was awesome. This book was starting to kind of wear a little bit thin on me at issue number three. It just seemed to be too much about this dude's writer's block or whatnot, but then in four, it got kind of ramped up. And then five, that action ramps up even further. And then... <laughs> It gets very Power Rangers. It gets very Power Rangers. Now, here's the thing. This book, to me, is kind of an up-and-down journey. Like, I liked this issue. I thought the artwork was amazing. Is that uh, Eduardo uh, Ferrigato and Marcella Costa on the coloring, right? Yeah, loved. Loved. Oh, there's two different artists. And the colorist is Natalia Mark. There's two different artists? <gasps> oh, yeah. That, that, wow, I never even noticed that. The artwork's awesome in this book. The coloring, it's big. The action scenes are slam-bang powerful. I don't still want to spoil what happened in the last one in case you're trade waiting it, but there was a big reveal in the last one. I like how they spun it into this, but then all of a sudden, like straight up, yo, bro, is this just Power Rangers? Like, Kyle, you did Power Rangers. You, you did Power Rangers. Aside from that, I mean, Radiant Black's pretty cool, but like, bro, you just trying to do Power Rangers with death? Ah, uh, okay. Berserker is here. Did no, okay. Berserker's here with issue number three. Two foil variants. I love these foil covers. You know me. Berserker number three is really cool. I'm loving this book. Matt Kent, Keanu Reeves. Come on. And Ron Garney. Ron Garney's doing his really, his best, uh, like Klaus Jansen. This book is violent. It's gory. It's brutal. This is continuing on the origin of the Berserker, who he is, where he came from, and the psychological damage that's being done to this dude, having spent centuries, millennia, just in this perpetual cycle of violence. Uh, I'm really liking the book. I thought that this was a cool way to kind of step back into the past and just mostly focus in on that. But now we're about to get back into the future gear, and I love the way it ended. Um, I like this book. It's brutal. It's violent. It's bloody. Um, but it's got, it's got a, a, a thread of humanity. A thread of something is... Drink every time you hear that tonight, y'all. Seven Secrets is here with issue number nine. Loving this book. Uh, great action sequences. Uh, Danielle DiNaculo. Um, fantastic on the art. I love the layouts, the design, especially on the action scenes. Uh, like that layout right there. Fantastic work. And you get a lot of that in this kind of book. This is a, a book about this organization that there's these seven grand secrets. 
Um, in the first story arc, they build up who they are. They're protecting these Seekers from this, uh, this organization called the Seekers that are after them. And then the, the Seekers struck really hard in issue number six. All of this has now been uh, the seven Secret holders and, and, and it's them like kind of on the run trying to regroup and pick new leadership. And there's a lot of craziness that's been going on. And the way Tom Taylor is still able to thread in, thread, thread, thread. Did he say thread? He did. Um, but he didn't make, okay. So Seven Secrets though, the way that Tom Taylor is able to still keep threading in this um, this humanity, this, this emotional content, but at the same time give us a really interesting concept, really dynamic action provided by the artwork. Um, I'm loving this book. And this one has a lot of setup on the hero side and on the villain side. So it was mostly kind of a setup issue, but definitely worth it. Seven Secrets, number nine. Beautiful. Save Yourself, number one. It's a new one from Boombox. Um, this one's all right. Bones, Leopard, Kelly, and Nicole Matthews. The artwork in this book was really nice. So I really like the artwork in this book. Um, what is it about? So it's about this woman. She doesn't get out much. She kind of gets tricked by her friends to go out to this like singles mingle type thing. Um, and then like all of a sudden these there are these heroes that are on this earth that are trying to allegedly save us from alien threat or something like that. And she comes across one of these heroes and kind of develops a crush on her. And it gets way more complex than that. And so they kind of let you know one thing and then they subvert it towards the end. It was pretty decent. It was all right. Um, I don't know. This book was all right. It didn't quite super wow me, but it wasn't dull or anything like that. It was kind of in the middle, but the artwork was dope. So maybe I'll come back and check out issue number two. Save yourself number one. That's from Boombox. Boombox is like booms, like middle-aged readers kind of imprint. From Aftershock, we have Seven Swords, number one. Seven Swords has a really cool concept. What if seven of the best sword slashing, swashbuckling heroes of all literature? I mean, we're talking about Don Juan. We're talking about the Three Musketeers. We're talking about that kind of stuff, right? What if they all come together and form a super team, a super group, right? It's like Mad Season, right? Anyway, uh, Seven Swords, though... It's a cool concept, but the execution got a little jarring. There is one thread of a main story that is working, and that's the character that's connected to Three Musketeers. That was working for me. The artwork was cool, and I was really digging it, but every once in a while it goes to another scene, and it's so freaking jarring. They literally give you little to no information about certain moments when they switch bits. And when they switch bits, it kind of, like I said, it jarred me. So this is a really cool concept that I think could really work. But the execution was just a bit wonky and a bit off for me. But that was Seven Swords number one from Aftershock. From Ablaze, we have Space Pirate Captain Harlock. I had no idea what this is based on. My friend told me it's an anime, I think, or manga, it's an anime, right? I, I don't know. But the artwork in this book was great. The story seemed fine. They did a lot of setup. Like they, they spend like the first third of this book, I guess, explaining what the hell this is for people like me. Um, if you're a fan, and I know there are fans of Space Pirate Captain Harlock, because I've had a lot of people talk about it. Um, I think you'll like this book. The artwork was great. Um, a Blaze does like these new trans like English translations of like foreign work. And and usually the European, they they the European comic market, they really know how to like compose and lay out a page and that's always been one of the things that blows me away it feels like something's lost in translation for me i wasn't quite into this one but like i said it was interesting enough but somebody somebody enlighten me is this based on anime or a manga or something like that anyway maybe i should check out the anime or the manga whatever it's based on but if you're a fan there you go also from a blaze though we have the sumerian iron shadows in the moon this is the final issue of this story Y'all, I'm sold on the Sumerian. I'm loving this stuff. This is great. It's like brutal, bloody, violent Conan stories without Marvel editorial making it like, like nice and shiny. And, and doing like actual adaptations of the Robert E. Howard work. And I find that very refreshing. So I have the Frost Giant's Daughter. I'm going to be reading that. And now I'm going to have to hunt down what came before. So if somebody can help me, just let me know. But y'all... I'm loving this book, and I know that each story is done by a different team, but like the artwork, the way it's laid out, the, I really liked it. And this was one where the translation actually works for me. They also have the printed original story in the back, which I'm just loving. Y'all, The Sumerian, y'all need to be reading that. 
Sad day because Resonant ends. Resonance here with issue number 10 from Vault Comics. D.B. Andre, friend of the show, Skylar Patridge, uh, Jason Wordy, and Darren Bennett. Darren Bennett, by the way, just nominated for an Eisner for Best Letter, so that's awesome. Uh, you find out why he's nominated in, page, in the pages of Resonant, I'll tell you what, because he adds, along with Jason Wordy, so much richness, texture, and, and just like an audible quality, right? Skylar came into this book on the second and final arc um, and with a different style, but by the end here, the artwork works so freaking perfect. I would have liked to have seen her do every single page. Like, this book was awesome. The ending was perfection. I would have loved to see this book go another 5 to 10 to 15 issues. Unfortunately, that's just not to be. But I'll tell you this. Resonant number 10 did a fantastic job of wrapping up the story and not making it feel rushed. Usually in these kind of stories that could go on for a while, but they could wrap up if they need to, they, they just feel like they wrap up out of nowhere. And you can definitely feel how the story could have evolved and grown and done a lot more had it been allotted more time. But it still feels like a very natural progression and a very natural ending, a very satisfactory ending, and still open enough that we could return one day to the world of Resonant. This was a great survival uh, horror-type book. Not really horror, but like... It's about the survival after a big catastrophe and, and how you pick up your pieces and the importance of family and, and the journey to, to finding that out. Um, I loved it. Resonant number two or number 10, amazing. Freaking amazing. Stake is here with issue number four. I missed out on issue three, got caught up, read issue number four. This is a great vampire hunting book from Scout Comics. This is one of Scout's best being published right now. The artwork is great. Um, they do really interesting things with the coloring. Only little bits are colored here and there. Um, but it works, and it has a really nice quality about it. The story is fun. I thought this was a very exceptional issue. Stake is a character um, whose life was ruined by a vampire, so now she wants to kill vampires, but she has to go and join the vampire hunting agency or whatever, where she's trained and partnered up with an actual vampire, because vampires can be good or they can be bad. There's lots of Buffy references. Um, there's lots of Lost Boys references in this. It's really, really fun. Um, the characters are exciting, um, and the, the, the stakes are high. Steak number four is out this week. I loved it. And let's talk about Nottingham. Nottingham number four. This is the penultimate issue of the Mad Cave book um, that I'm loving. It's a different spin, unique take on Robin Hood where it kind of paints the Sheriff of Nottingham as the hero. Robin Hood and the Merry Men are kind of like terrorist villains, right? Um, not really good guys. And so it's an interesting uh, juxtaposition there. It's an interesting way to kind of subvert the typical story and make something that's very familiar, but at the same time, a bit different, especially with the way that it's nuance work. So I'm loving this book. I love the artwork. It's big. It's strong. It's got a unique style all to itself, but I think that four issues in, it's really identified itself. And with one more to go, I'm excited to see how it wraps up. This book has been cool. If you like subverted different, uh, uh, versions of classic stories, definitely check out Nottingham. There's a bunch of reprints for issue number one and two out this week, so it's a good chance to get caught up, but that's one of Matt Cave's best right now, as well as Beckstar, which comes out, I think, next week, so I'm very excited about that. Anyway, that's what I read. That's what I thought. What are you reading? What are you digging? Let us know in the comments down below, and once again, Bueller, from the bottom of my heart, and on behalf of everybody here in the PCP crew, excitable we are, and the PCP army, and just... The world station, my man, 20K. Couldn't happen to a better person. You deserve it. You are worth it, Bueller. Anyway, be sure to jump over to Bueller's socials and tell him congrats on 20K. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Like I said, let us know in the comments down below what you're reading, what you're digging. Be sure to like, share, subscribe. Click the notification bell. Join us at popculturephilosophers.com. Join the PCP Army on Facebook. Subscribe over at patreon.com slash PCP to help support the channel. Do all that, whatever you wish. But just be back here next week for the weekly comic book review. Thank you so much for rocking with us. Keep on reading. Station!